Okay, so today you guys got two handouts. Uh, you also should have turned in your assignment 101s. They should have been posted by right now because that's when I started talking. Um, your assignment 102, you're welcome to read through it. I'm trying to give you some, some forewarning on it. Uh, you'll notice that it's not due until the 14th of September, so it's a little bit of a ways off. Um, when you get back from Labor Day weekend, remember no class on Monday. And when you get back, so next, the next time we see each other, uh, I'll show you a bunch of examples and we'll talk about what makes successful examples, etc. cetera. Uh, you can, of course, look back through stuff that people have done in previous semesters um, to get ideas and kind of think through what you want to do for your assignment 102. So that's there, so you can kind of be thinking about it. Um, and you can obviously see examples, etc. But we'll talk uh, at more length about it a week from today, on, on Wednesday the 7th. Uh, today we have exercise 106, and we're going to talk about two things that I think are really fun to talk about. Uh, they certainly are more on the artistic side than necessarily the useful side. However, for those couple of you that have taken the Rhino class already, and we talked a lot about HDRI background images. You guys remember that a little bit, right? This should seem somewhat familiar, OK? This is the other side of it. This is how you would be creating some of that sort of thing. So it definitely has an architectural use. For our purposes today, it's more about artistic representation, maybe about site analysis, or, or something along those lines. But I'm going to try to walk you through two topics. One is called high dynamic range photography, and the other is called panoramic photography. And it's interesting because these two have evolved quite a lot in the last, say, seven or eight years. Um, and so we'll talk about that as we go forward. So let's start with high dynamic range photography first so that we get a kind of a sense of, of why this is important and what it is. So high dynamic range is a set of techniques that allow a greater dynamic range uh, in the luminances, so the, the light settings, within a particular image and between the lightest and darkest areas of an image. So we see the example to the right here. We've got the kind of standard photo on the right half and a high dynamic range version of that photo on the left. Right? Obviously, the left photo looks a lot better than the one on the right. Um, the left photo looks a lot more like what we would see if we were actually in, the, um, in, that, in that environment. So this is an example of a high dynamic range photo. Uh, anytime you see these kinds of dramatic sunset sky scenes, etc., there's a pretty good chance that somebody used some high dynamic range uh, background processing in this, um, just to get this kind of level of color and saturation, etc. So what are we fundamentally doing? We're taking three images five images, seven images, right? In this example, I have three. And we're taking something that is what our camera would deem the um, correct exposure. So this image here would be the first image. And that's the correct exposure, OK? The second image would be here. And that's underexposed, right? So it's deliberately darker than the normal settings, right? And the third image here is deliberately lighter. And if we were to look at different parts of these images, and I know I have them overlapping because it doesn't really matter, but the lighter image is capturing detail kind of down in here, right, in those waves and the shadows in the ocean, right? We would lose that right in here and right in here, right? Because in that version, it's just all dark. And certainly, we would have no detail in this. So we're taking those three images, and we're combining those three images together to create this. Okay, so any one of those first three images, if I jump back a slide here, right, don't look as good. Right? They're, they're not combining that greater range of luminances. Okay? But when we jump to the post-processed version, we're getting the detail in the small parts of the ocean, the little waves, we're getting a great sunset, etc. Right? So it's that combination, that fusion of individual exposures. So why would we go about doing this? Okay? Well, there's a couple reasons. Right? On the surface, it's artistic. Certainly, the, the, if we were taking a picture of a sunset, the second option, the high dynamic range version, looks a lot better. Wouldn't you agree? So that's kind of an artistic thing. Okay? But what we're trying to do fundamentally is we're trying to mimic how we actually see the world. And I mentioned this when we talked about the first, um, in the first photography lesson, about how you go out and you see this beautiful sunset. And you say, oh man, I've got to get my phone out. I'm going to capture a picture. This is great. And then you look at the picture after, and you're like, man, it was a lot prettier in person than it was on whatever I took on my phone. Right? Has this happened to you? 
right? It must have happened to you, right? Well, our eyes see the world differently than a camera lens, right? A camera lens is fixed. It has a set exposure. We look at it one way, and that's all we can see, right? Our eyes are dynamic, right? They're always changing. Our brains are processing what we're seeing, right? If we all looked right now down at the feet under, look down, right, deep in the shadows, and then quick look up and outside, you can still see all the detail that's outside because your brain compensates that fast, and you can see the bright stuff. Right? Now, as you get older, right, and this is starting to happen to me, I'm starting to age myself, right? If you go from something that's really bright to something that's really dark, you can't see anymore in the dark because your eyes don't process and they don't adjust fast enough, right? And so when you change those environments, it's harder. So you're seeing effectively in that context in low dynamic range because it's taking your brain longer to, to change and your eyes longer to adjust. But right now, the hope is, you guys are all young, um, the hope is that your brains compensate, your eyes compensate really fast, right? And you get to see the world in high dynamic range, okay? So when we take a picture and we post-process in high dynamic range, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see the world the way our eyes actually see it, okay? There is another reason beyond the, the, the artistic version, okay? In this class, as I said, we're gonna focus on the artistic version making the images pretty, right? But there is a technical version that's important when we get into, say, the 136 class, which I hope you all take, okay? Some of you have already taken it. When we get in there, we use these special types of images called high dynamic range images, not for the pretty background, but because they have enough information in them to be able to adjust to the certain light settings that we put. If we change the time of day, the amount of sun, less sun, more sun, that compensates in this high dynamic range image. And the background image actually changes based because we have all this extra information. So it's something that's very, very important when we get into the world of rendering. And that's part of why, as an introductory design class, I think it's important that you understand what this high dynamic range thing is. Okay? So there is this factor. We're not going to touch it in this class. But when you take 136, we'll get to it. Okay? So tone mapping is the post-processing that allows us to see good quality high dynamic range images, right? What it's doing is it's looking through the image and it's adjusting contrast in localized areas so that we're seeing good black and white values, right, and gray values in specific areas of an image. So if something's lighter, it's taking more information from the overexposed image and putting that in. If something's darker, right, it's taking information from the darker image and putting it in. Right? So it's taking pieces of these images and putting them together. And that's what tone mapping is essentially doing. Right? It can be applied to produce images with a preserved or exaggerated, and I'll show you both, right? um, local contrast. And it, so like something like this looks more like we would see it, looks normal. Right? It's realistic, so to speak. We can push the boundaries of that quite a lot. Okay? So it reduces the dynamic range or contrast ratio of the entire image right, while retaining localized contrast between neighboring pixels, right, which is essentially saying we're taking pieces of one image and pieces of another image and, and, and putting them all together, okay, to get these, these style images. So we've got a variety of software choices for how we're going to do this post-processing, okay. Obviously, we wouldn't be here in a Photoshop class if Photoshop couldn't do this, right. So we're going to use Photoshop today. Um, it allows us to do some of the post-processing. It doesn't really have great built-in tone mapping. You need a plug-in to do that really well. I think they've made some improvements in the new Creative Cloud version of Photoshop in terms of what it can do and the tone mapping that it can do, et cetera. And CS, the, the updates to CS6 make it significantly better than earlier versions, but it's not quite as good as some of the standalone applications, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It is available, obviously, on all the lab computers, which is fantastic, right? And with some creative masking, which is kind of the point of the other thing that we'll talk about today in Photoshop, um, you'll be able to do almost anything that you could do in a standalone application, and we'll talk through that. Okay? The other kind of gold standard software application that does this is a program called Photomatics. Um, it's an independent company that makes it, but they sell a plug-in for Photoshop. 
So you could just open your image in Photoshop and then use the plugin to do the processing. They also make a standalone application. They make a uh, plugin for Lightroom, which is that photo management application. So you don't even have to go outside of that to do it if you wanted to. Uh, and it's a little bit pricey, you know, 40 to, to 100 bucks. There's an academic discount uh, if it's something you get passionate about and really interested in. Okay, so let's look at some examples of high dynamic range images. I've tried to couple these into the realistic examples and the little bit beyond surreal examples. Okay, so here's our most uh, basic setup here. Uh, in this context, the top image is the, the regular um, image. So we go in. And let's say in this context, I'm trying to put this into a use context or why this might be important to you. Okay, let's say that you're working for a real estate agent and you have to go out and you have to photograph a particular building. Right? If we go out and we photograph this floor of the building and we're trying to lease it, say, to somebody or we're trying to sell it to somebody, right? and we post the, the top image online, it's okay. I mean, we can get a sense of the space, but you don't have any idea what's going on outside the windows. Maybe it has a good view, maybe it doesn't have a good view. Okay? So instead, we jump down here right, to the high dynamic range image and look at how much more detail is in the windows. We now understand that we have a whole view of the skyline from this building. Right? This lower image is going to sell a lot better than the upper image, simply because it's high dynamic range. Right? So we're getting this information that's outside the windows in the context uh, of the overall image. So we get what's outside and what's inside. Okay? The same thing could happen in this room if we were, if we were taking a picture. We want to show that it's, it's wide open uh, through these really cold single pane pieces of glass that are going to keep us really cold in December. Um, it's wide open to the, the courtyard. Right? If we were trying to take an image of that and I were standing way over here looking that way, I could either have the outside exposed correctly and all of you dark or I could have all of you exposed correctly and outside way too bright, unless I used high dynamic range, in which case I could have both. Okay, Something like this, kind of the, the, the typical shot um, approaching evening when all the lights are on and stuff, it's a good opportunity to use high dynamic range if you want a lot of color saturation in the image. So something like this has a lot of reds and a lot of blues in it. If you want that kind of saturation, high dynamic range can be a very good option for you. Sometimes. This looks like a relatively normal photo, right? But in this context, they wanted just a little bit more detail in the shadows uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have. Okay, so not not too out of the ordinary, not too surreal or anything. Uh, very much a regular image. An image like this, again, very much a regular image. Not the best composition of image, right? Remember, composition still matters, right? Rule of third would be nice. Push that over a little bit, but. We have this, we see nice color in the sky, we see all the lights exposed, but we also see all the bushes down here at the bottom. They're not black. If we took this as a regular photograph, all of those would be too dark and washed out. So by doing it as a high dynamic range image, we get all of that. Okay? Something like this, again, a very normal image. It looks better on the screen than it does on that screen. But we get all the detail down below here in the shadows, right in the bottom section. All of that would be just black in a standard photo. So we get a little bit more detail there. Right? Something like this. This is starting to push a little bit into the surreal. Right? But I like this image because it tells you something about how the, the, the high dynamic range images work. So in this context, I want you to focus right down here at the bottom in that corner. Okay? Do you see the car, the white car? Okay? There's actually three versions of the white car because there were three images taken to make the high dynamic range image and the car moved in those three images. So you get something like this where if things move and they don't stand still, you end up having multiple versions of an object because you're compositing the images together. So it's really important to recognize that that's something that happens in these kinds of images and you have to compensate for. So it's much easier to take a high dynamic range image of say nature without right, city traffic and cars because things aren't moving. Okay? In this context, something's moving. You know, maybe the right solution is to crop this image so that that car goes away, and we look at this as the image instead. Right? Or maybe you're OK with the, the three versions of the car. I don't know. It's something you've got to think about. Right? Maybe you mask it out a little bit. Another example here, a very, very simple plain image. 
much more detail in the shadow than we otherwise would get if it wasn't a high dynamic range image. Right, similar, similar here. Okay, kind of the drama, but again, enough detail in the rocks that would otherwise be lost. I can't help myself but show lots of examples, right? That's just kind of the nature of it. We get to look at lots of, lots of pictures. Okay? And all of these are high dynamic range images, right? That one's a little blurry. Again, sunsets, prime, prime opportunity for this. So let's shift from the just trying to see what we see in the world to the surreal, right? The even more artistic versions. And I like to show you this because you can obviously push high dynamic range beyond quote, real. But you have to recognize that you're pushing it beyond real in a sense that this is now becoming an art piece rather than an actual photograph. Okay? So let's look at some of them. Right? This one certainly looks somewhat real, but see how it has that kind of misty quality to it? Right? And there's almost these, this like ghosty fog or whatever. This is pushing the boundaries, especially in the sky. Okay? Something like this. Okay? If we were standing looking at this really cool haunted house, Right, probably didn't have that dark of a sky. Right? It would be really scary if the sky was that dark. Okay? But certainly if we look at this image as the, I'm trying to photograph the haunted house, right, this kind of post-processing and the mood of this really does a pretty good job of coming across as that kind of haunted, cool, old building. Right? So it's pushing the boundary, but it's still really tastefully done. All right, something like this. I don't think the sky was quite this painterly in reality. So it's, again, pushing the envelope a little bit. But it doesn't take away from the fact that it's a really stunning image, right? well composed and all the rest of it. So again, moving in the direction of art. Right? Something like this you guys are all familiar with. Right? Again, pushing the boundaries. It didn't really look like this. The sky didn't really look like this. Right? So this may be going a little bit on the extreme side. Okay? So this one's post-processed. Uh, also uh, exaggerated a bit, but I use this as, as an example of the panoramas that we're going to see. Right? So this is a full 360 panorama that has the HDRI tone mapping applied to it. So you don't, you're not limited to just the single frame. Another example here, the color saturation is just a little bit too much uh, in this context. Likewise, pushing the boundaries a little bit, I don't think the, uh, the wood deck at the bottom really look like that. Right, again, the, the super mood of the shot, right? the black sky and that sort of thing, just doesn't really happen. That's a little blurry. OK, so let's move from high dynamic range, which is the first topic of the lecture, to the second topic, which is panoramic photography. How many people have ever shot a panorama with their phone? Right? It's amazing how easy it is now. Okay? And I will, I will freely admit that the world of panoramic photography was something that I got really obsessed with in about 2002 or 3. Okay? So this was like ancient history. But I got really obsessed with it, and I got obsessed with it enough to where I wrote a bunch of my master's thesis around panoramic photography, and that was in 2006, six seven. So I got really obsessed with it, and things have changed, right? The iPhone didn't exist before I started writing my thesis, right? Like, you couldn't take these panoramas really easy. So things have certainly changed a lot, but I think it's still a very valid topic, especially when we get into the world of rendering and using these as backdrops for rendering. Um, and so those of you two that were in 136, you remember a lot about this stuff. Okay? So I have to tell you about it now so that you're prepared. So what is a panorama? Right? A panorama is fundamentally a very wide angle view of something. 
okay? When I talk about a full 360 panorama, it should wrap around and connect behind. So it goes 360 degrees around. You could look in any direction, right? And those are the, really the most valuable ones for us, okay? So if we were gonna create a panorama, right, we need to stitch a bunch of images together. So we take images, they overlap, we align them, right, and they become one continuous image. That's the idea, okay? When you take your phone out and you switch to the panorama mode and you do this, right, when you do that, essentially your phone is stitching multiple images together as you move the phone, right? It just does it on the fly. But what we're gonna do in Photoshop is actually take three or four images and stitch them together, okay, to make this panorama. So there are some fundamental mechanics that are important for us to talk about relating to panoramic photography because we end up with problems. And the, the primary problem is something called parallax. And it has to do with how you set up your camera and how you shoot the panorama in the first place. Okay? And when you stitch these images together, it starts to become very important. So number one, we have to isolate something that's called the nodal point uh, in your camera. And the nodal point, and I'm going to pull out, this is my old school panorama rig from, from when I was in grad school, but it's a really good one, okay? So what the nodal point does, so what the nodal point does is it isolates the point at which the image comes into the camera, flips, and goes back and hits the sensor. That point that it flips is called the nodal point of the camera. And when we take these images, and I'll show you parallax and I'll show you kind of a combination of things, what we're trying to do is isolate that nodal point, wherever it is, such that if the camera spins, that nodal point is always in the same spot, right? Furthermore, if I were to take the camera and I were to drop it, say, and shoot higher, you see the nodal point stays in the same place. If I were to shoot lower, the nodal point again stays in the same place. So the advantage of a camera rig or something like this is that it keeps that nodal point isolated and we don't get these parallax errors. So if we look at the digital version or the equivalent of this, right, you see here, you see that uh, in the, the image here on the side, right, it's essentially that red dot is that nodal point that I was just talking about, okay? So let's take a step forward here and look at it down as if we were looking in plan, okay? So in the first example here, right, we take our image, this is this one right here, we take our image straight on, there's a red object and a blue object that are in line in reality, right? It would be as if I were in this room, right, and we were looking at these tables and the line goes all the way through, okay? If I rotate the camera not around the nodal point, which is part two here, right, we take the picture looking this direction like that, right, this first object and this second object are no longer in alignment. There they are in the viewfinder. See how the blue one is off to the left and the red one is in the center, right? Where in the first one, the red one and the blue one are on top of each other, okay? If we rotate instead around the nodal point, so right there, around the nodal point of the camera, right? The second image as we rotate around, they stay in the same context. The red and the blue stay on top of each other, okay? So that's why the nodal point is important. Let's see some actual photographic examples here of what parallax does. Okay. If you've ever looked at street view, this stuff happens all the time in street view. Okay. Um, this kind of thing up above where we've got the, um, the little power lines that don't line up with the other power lines, that's a parallax error. Okay. Um, if buildings don't quite line up with buildings, right, we get parallax. Here we've got a painted line on the ceiling or a conduit or something, and they don't quite line up with each other. Right. This is a rather minor one. Okay. Here, much more major, right? The whole building shifts up, right? Those are big problems. So in a true good quality panorama, there are no parallax errors. It's as if you were standing there, you could look anywhere and it looks exactly like it should, okay? So final results, right? We have two things that are, that are kind of the final results. We can have an unrolled image where we take that full 360, we peel it open, and it gives us the panorama, right? Or we can have an interactive movie. And you guys have all looked at these kinds of things before, right? It was originally um, through a software that Apple developed called QuickTime. 
Now everything can be done on the web and it's just kind of irrelevant. You don't have to worry about what it was in. But the point is that it's an interactive view, right? And we've actually gone the next step further and I've been waiting for this to happen since my thesis because I talked about it in my thesis and I actually tried to do it in my thesis. We're now getting to the point where we have not 3D video but immersive video, right? You wear the little goggles and you can look anywhere you want, right? Uh, GoPro just came out with something where you can mount like six GoPros on a ball and they shoot video in all directions at once and stitch it together and it's this interactive video thing. Um, this is the direction it's been going for 10 or 15 years, right? Trying to get to that interactive video where, where you can be a part of whatever the, the video is that's going on, right? It's, it's kind of true video virtual reality. It's a really interesting concept. This is the most simple version of it, right? You drag on the screen and you can look at whatever you're trying to look at. Software, okay, so how do we do this post-processing? Well, guess what? Photoshop does it, right? I wouldn't tell you if, we wouldn't be doing it if Photoshop didn't do it. So Photoshop is absolutely great at doing this for maybe up to 10 images, right? You have 10 overlapping images, it stitches it just fine, okay? If I tried to throw a full 360 at it, there's a pretty good chance something would go wrong. Right? It wouldn't quite stitch some of the images together or whatever. So it's not good for the full 360, but it's great. Let's say you're in 220, you go to a site, you're going to do an architectural design on this particular site. You take a bunch of pictures, you can stitch them together in Photoshop as long as those pictures overlap. Okay? It's a completely automated process. You dump the pictures in, it gives you the stitched result at the end. You don't do anything, right? which makes your life really easy because you can check Facebook or whatever while you're doing it. Okay? But you don't have that much control in the process. So there are other options that are out there. Uh, Stitcher was an absolutely incredible program in about 2004 or so, right? Good enough as a program at stitching these images together such that Autodesk, the makers of AutoCAD, big company, said, you know what? We should buy this company. It was a European company. So Autodesk bought the company. And then they stopped working on the software in 2009. <laughs> that sucks, right? It's too bad. I would have really liked to see where this, this piece went. But it does exist, uh, or did exist. I think it might even still be on Autodesk's website, but it's way out of date, right? So it's not really current. But it was really graphic, because you could take an image, you could drag it up on the screen, you could put it about where it belonged, and then press Enter, and it would like warp the image into the correct thing. It was a really cool user interface. So anyway. That was there. So what are, what are the other options that are out there now? Uh, there's two options, really, that I think. PT GUI is the paid version of the free option that I'll show you in a second. It's a little bit faster. And essentially, what these do is it's a much finer uh, grain control over your images. You take an, one image, you take another image, and you can actually pick control points. This corner is the same on this image as it is in that image. Right? And you overlap by these control points, and the, the program actually warps the images to stitch them together based on all these control points that you assign. And it's good enough to manually find control points. Right? We can see some of the control points over here, the blue and the green. It's good enough to manually find some of those control points, but you can also go in and specify, no, this is in fact that point. Right? And so they, they stitch together. Um, Hug-in is the free version, absolutely free. You can download it on your home computer. It's like SketchUp. Right? And so if this is something you're interested in doing, why not try it out and see? They're supposed to be installed on the lab computers, uh, this Hug-In program. It's kind of hit or miss. They just redid the computers. I haven't confirmed that, that it works. Um, I've had semesters where it works great. I've had semesters where it doesn't work right? because they redo the, the computers. So if it works, I'll show you how to do it. If it doesn't, then we'll, we'll skip that portion. Okay? So Photosphere. Uh, I think Google just updated it to be called Places or something, something else. Um, anyway, it's, it's by Google. Anybody played with this before? Right, it's pretty fun, right? You get, take out your phone, you stand in a place, and it kind of guides you through taking a panorama. Okay? You can get really, really nice results through this. It's stitching together kind of on the fly. Again, it works better if instead of you standing and like taking your pictures, which gives you parallax, if you keep the phone in the same place and you move around the phone instead. Okay? So you can still use the same principles that we were talking about earlier with your phone to get a better quality image. It also works great outside, not so good inside because we get lots of parallax and stuff when it's a small confined space. So let's look at some examples. The examples that I'm going to show you are all unrolled images. 
right? So these are flattened out, they're, they're, they're distorted. What you're going to find, right, in these images is that images, it, things in, in the world, right, that are straight lines, when you get into a panorama, appear curved or appear arcing. Things that are arcing or curved appear straight. So it's this weird uh, counterintuitive thing. So this was an example. This is in Peru. <clears throat> um, see this, that line that's on both sides up there? The dark little piece, right? One of the other things that's critical when you're, when you're shooting a panorama is that you shoot in the same exposure all the way around, right? If your exposure changes, the images won't fuse together correctly and they won't look like it. So that particular image, the exposure on my camera changed when I was shooting and then I get the line. Now, could I post-process it afterward in Photoshop, make that go away with a clone stamp? Sure, right? But I, I left it in for you guys to see that that kind of stuff does happen, okay? Another example here, this was not a full 360 going up and going down, it's just a full th 360 going around in one row, which is why we get the little scalloped edges on the top and the bottom, because those are, this for example is one image, that's the next image, okay? Another example here, and part of the advantage of these big panoramas is you can actually see a whole lot of what's going on, right, as part of this image. Where if you had an individual camera with an individual shot, you wouldn't be able to get all of this as part of the image. Okay. The other thing you have to be careful of when you're shooting these, so a uh, 360 panorama on my rig is somewhere between uh, probably 40 and 44 images. Uh, that are going to be stitched together to give me the full 360. If you make a mistake and you miss one, you end up with the black hole, <laughs> right? Now again, could I take that into Photoshop and do a little bit of clone stamping over it? Sure, right? I could make it go away, but it would certainly be better if I actually had that image uh, to begin with, okay? So remember what I said about straight lines appear curved, curved lines appear straight, okay? So we see a very straight set of lines here, okay? What does this look like in reality? It's a circle, right? So this is in Mirai. We are standing right here in the center of that circle, right? And we took a picture of all those lines, right? So this is a good, good way of showing you what happens in a panorama. That's why I like this image. Okay. Another example here. Right, this one I, I believe is, a, is one of the sample set that I'm gonna give you today if you wanna play around with it, um, where it will actually stitch to be a full 360, uh, top and bottom. And one of the things that's, that's important to recognize about these kinds of images is if you take really high quality images that are individuals and you stitch all those individual images together, you can end up with something that has very, very high resolution, right? And in the full resolution version of this particular photo, Right, we can look all the way at top, all the way through this to the other side of the mountain, and there's a bunch of little, um, little terraces and all that sort of thing. In the full size image, you can see all that detail. You can zoom in and you can see all that detail, right? Because it's a composite of so many images. Right? Another example here, this is the other side looking back across. This was actually the image that sparked my whole thesis. <laughs> um, this was uh, in the abandoned train station in West Oakland, the Amtrak's train station. I don't even know if it's still standing anymore. It's a really cool old building. Is it still there? It's awesome. It, probably, yeah. So this was probably in like 2003 or 2004. Uh, it was very much abandoned at that point, and it was totally cool. It was just a great old building. Anyway, so we went there, and when I shot the image, remember that because it's a composite of so many images, right, that are overlapping, I was able to capture how people were actually moving through the space. So I have all these ghosted people, right, and those ghosted people started to spawn the whole idea of what is a space like over time, right, and that then worked into my thesis as well. Worcester Hall, some of you may move on and live here, literally. <laughs> Um, and actually, you probably will never see the building at this time of day. It's more likely that you're going to see the building at this time of day, right? Uh, so I forget, I forget, I think I shot this at like 2 in the morning and every light in the building was on, right? It's quite entertaining, right? Uh, but anyway, so this is, this is Worcester Hall. Um, again, straight lines appear curved. You can see that very prominently here um, in this. 
So the other thing is, because it's a composite of lots of images, this is one that a good friend of mine and, and, and I put together uh, when we were playing around with stitching images. And every image that we shot, we shot ourselves in it. So you can see multiple versions of ourselves as we go through the whole, you know. So I'm standing here. I have a lot of hair then. That was nice. Uh, I'm standing there. <laughs> I'm sitting over here. You know, I'm, I'm standing over here. I'm back over here. I'm looking at myself over there. So we were playing around with the idea, right, that you're in the image multiple times because you have all these frames to go together. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Here, this was in this little confined space, right? And I like this image because it shows you some of the problems that happen, right? So in this context, we I shot a couple rounds around, and as I was shooting, right, the 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 center image here, ah, that was great. No problem, we kept going, overlap, overlap, overlap. Then I shot this lower part here. Well, I got half a person, right? Just the legs are sitting there. And so when it's stitched together, it's a little awkward because it's like, wait a minute, I have somebody's legs, right? So in reality, I shouldn't have taken that picture when the person was standing right there because it's so close, right? But it's certainly something to be aware of that you can end up with half people and that sort of thing, right? More fun, right? So this one was on the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. I didn't have all of this stuff with me, right? But I just took my camera out and I shot it. And you'll notice if you look carefully at this particular image, there isn't any parallax, right? And the reason that there isn't any parallax is I use the same principles that I use with my tripod when I shot it by hand. So instead of moving the camera around, right, I got the camera as close as I could and then I moved around the camera when I shot it. So it's just a fundamental change in, in how you do it can get you a really nice result for something like this. Right? So it's just a mechanical change. Uh, this is uh, in Alameda at the Naval Air Station. Similar thing, where it's just shot by hand. Right? We can go through lots of these a little bit faster. Right? That, this image would have been a whole lot better if it was high dynamic range. Right? So we can do a high dynamic range version of a panorama. You're just taking the 40 something shots that it would take and multiplying by three. Right? And then you're doing high dynamic range processing and a panorama processing anyway. But it would have been a not prettier image. Right? I like hiking, so I tend to haul this gear around when I hike. It's like my, my hobby. Well, it was my hobby and then I had kids and then not so much anymore. Although my daughter's starting to get old enough, I can take her now. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, you get the idea. Um, by the way, um, for those of you that were in 136, remember we were doing the, the Tahoe and all that stuff? This is a little bit further up the mountain. The shoulder that you guys worked on is like right over in here. It gives you some context. More examples. Oh, um, let me jump back here. See the sun? and you've got the sun flares kind of bending down. It looks really weird when it's unrolled like this. When you switch it back into the 360 version where you're looking at it, it looks more normal, because as you look at it, those lines appear straight. Uh, but up here, they, they get all kind of wonky. More examples. Yo, there, there's, there's your other. You guys were right in there for content. I probably should have showed you these pictures. Oh, well. You did, oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, kind of getting creative about it, right, in how you unroll and how you warp. Um, these were images straight out of my thesis. I ended up working on an air, the San Francisco airport in my thesis, but there's a bunch of panoramas. I went there and, and shot tons and tons of panoramas um, for the fun of it. So there's, there's kind of one of the images about the interconnectedness of people and how they move through space. That was a diagram. We'll get to architectural diagrams a little later, right? And so because I was, I had to, this was an architectural thesis, I had to draw and stuff. I had to actually teach myself to draw panoramic images, which was kind of fun. So this is a perspective that's a panorama. So if you guys took uh, 130, you may have touched on kind of doing the, the perspective views a little bit. I don't know, they don't teach it that much anymore. But this is a, a, you're actually passing through a curved, like you were passing through a mirror ball. Anyway, it was a very complicated way of, of being able to draw what you were trying to create. Uh, and so the next image 
here. This is the last image that I'll show you here. This was the computer version of the final image that I had on my, pan uh, my uh, thesis. This image, when it was actually done, uh, was 20, 21 feet long. It was a big, long strip. And uh, it had a bunch of these put together. Uh, and then there was a bunch of ghosted people behind. And it got kind of involved. I have the drawing somewhere that you guys could see. But you get the idea. So it's the main panorama. And then there's all these side panoramas going off that were projected onto the walls and stuff. So you could see people coming and going. Anyway, this is like old history, right? <laughs> uh, OK, so what we're going to do is we'll take a, a brief break um, and so that I can log into the, um, the school computer, et cetera, and get ready. Uh, so why don't we come back at, say, 9.05, right? And then we'll go through kind of how to do the post-processing uh, on these images, how to stitch them together, how to do the HDRIs, et cetera. OK, so we're going to start up um, on exercise 106. And I'm going to walk you through it. I did confirm that Huggin is not installed in these computers, so we're going to skip that part of it. Um, so you won't have any experience with that. But such is life. You can do it on your own if you want to. Um, the part one is going to take the longest. Part two is, is actually relatively easy. Um, but I want to show you a bunch of stuff um, for part one uh, that talk about a, a topic that's called masking in Photoshop. And Masking will allow us to selectively apply certain things, adjustments or what have you, to parts of an image. Uh, and I'm going to show you kind of how that works. So on the course website, there are downloads of sample files um, for your high dynamic range image. If you go to today's, um, of course, everything works slow when you're trying to do it live. Uh, if you go to today's exercise, you'll be able to download uh, the sample files that I have for you. It will load. All right, so let me go back here. Sorry, it's running so slow here. OK, if we go to exercises and we go to today, to exercise 106. You could have shot your images in exercise 103, certainly. But if not, if we come all the way down here, a, a zip file of HDR samples group 1, group 2, and group 3. Okay, And so you you can right click, uh, say, Save Link As. And this is going to download a zip file. You'll want to make sure that you put it on your flash drive into your, oops. Sorry, right, wrong folder, 106. Uh, this would be HDR, and I'll go ahead and save that there. Then afterward, when it's done downloading, you'll need to expand that file to work with. Okay, So I already have it downloaded, so I'm not going to worry about, uh, about downloading it. I'm going to move on um, into the world of Photoshop. So first thing that I'm going to do is going to open up uh, Photoshop. And I have to do it in this order because I need um, I need to be able to just have nothing open in Photoshop when I start this process. So as I said earlier in the lecture, um, this is an automated process, the, the, the beginning um, part of it. So I'm going to go to the File menu. And I'm going to go to something called Automate. And I'm going to choo choose Merge to HDR Pro. And when I get that, I get this Merge to HDR Pro dialog box here. And so from this dialog box, I'm going to browse for my files. So let me go into today's folder. And I'm going to pick three files that go together. So here's the first three, one, two, and three. Right? And I'll work with those three first. 
I'll go ahead and say, OK, I held down Shift when I, when I clicked on them. I'll say, OK, and those will load right there, 1, 2, and 3. right? Uh, and I do want to make sure that this checkbox for attempt to automatically align source images is checked. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK. All right. And so that then brings up the Merge to HDR Pro dialog box. Okay. And so we can see already that we have a reasonably good result here. right? But we have some flexible uh, options. First thing that we can do is come up here. I always like the presets because it allows us to kind of go through some, some different settings. If I go to the presets, you can see that we've got some that are designed for specific purposes. So a city at twilight, for example, we could pick that. And it's going to change the settings. Now, to me, that doesn't look as good. So that's not the right option. Right? But we could come down here, and we could say photorealistic high contrast. All right, that's not too bad. We could try photorealistic low contrast. Right? That might be a little bit better. Okay? We could come down here. We could try saturated and see what that one does. That one might even be better. So the point is, play around with the presets first to see what the, the various options become. Okay? We can also adjust down here in the Advanced tab the shadow, the highlights, the vibrance, and the saturation. So for example, if I want the shadows to be darker, I can drag the shadows down. If I want them to be lighter, I can drag them up. Do you see how that only really affects the shadows? Right? I don't know if you guys can see it on the projector. Let's see that? No, you can't see it at all. But when you do it, <laughs> you'll be able to see it. OK? Uh, so the point is that you can come through and you can make these manual adjustments to it. Right? This is Photoshop's attempt at tone mapping. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Okay? So you get it to look the, the best that you can, and you'll go ahead and say OK when you're done. And we'll end up with one image that is the background with the tone, tone mapping process done to it, and we now have our overall image. Okay? I'm going to do this again on a different image so you can see the process again. I'll go to File, Merge to HDR, so fi File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro. And this time, I'll pick a different set of images. Let's do these images of Yosemite here, those three. And I'll go ahead and say OK. OK. okay. So here's our view from up top of Half Dome. I've got my three images loaded together. And again, I could go through the, the, the various options here, the presets to figure out which one looks the best. Once I have the option that looks the best, I'll go ahead and say OK. And again, I could adjust these sliders. I also have the ability to adjust the tone curve here. So I could, for example, tweak this down a little bit, tweak this back up over here a little bit. right? And that might be a little too far. So let's revert to the original setting. Okay? And we'll go ahead and say OK. And now I have this image. Right, so merging those images together isn't too, isn't too challenging, OK, because it does it for us. But now we want to get into some of the post-processing techniques, OK? So we've already worked on adjustment layers before. So let's try some adjustment layers and see what happens. Uh, the first one that I'm going to do is I'm going to do, because it's easiest for you to see me do it on the screen, I'm going to do a black and white adjustment layer. Okay, because it will, how the masking works will be very, very obvious with black and white. It's probably not the one that you'll ultimately choose to do. We'll probably do a curves, or we'll do a levels, or something like that. And I'll come back, and I'll do that in a second. But for the illustration purposes, I'm going to do it as a black and white. So I'm going to go up to Layer, and I'm going to go to New Adjustment Layer, and I'm going to go to a Channel Mixer. And I'm going to call this one black and white. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And there it is. So, I have the channel mixer here. I'll turn it to monochrome. And we'll pick something that, that makes it look decent. Yeah, maybe that one. Okay. All right. So the, you guys have seen the adjustment layers before. We've done this. Okay. But if I look at the layer palette here, we have the adjustment. And then next to it, we have a little chain. And then we have something that's white. Do you guys see that white square? That white square is something called a mask. 
right? And depending on what color, right, this square becomes, we can control how much or where on the image this particular adjustment is applied, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the white square so that it's highlighted and you kind of see the little, the highlights that go around it. And then I'll come over to my paintbrush tool, which is right here, the brush tool, okay? And I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger so that we can see it. Oops, sorry, wrong slider. All right, something like that. And I'm going to choose down here in my colors. I want the color that's on top to be black. So I'm going to flip the two colors. See that little double-headed arrow? I know it's behind my head, right? That double-headed arrow. I'm going to click on that double-headed arrow so that the black one is on top and the white one is underneath, right? And then, again, I have to be clicked on the mask. I'm going to go ahead and paint something on the scene here. So let's say that I paint, there's a nice little heart. I love Yosemite, right? <laughs> Okay, so you see how I painted that and suddenly the color comes back. Okay, so I have the ability to control where the adjustment layer is applying to the image itself. Right, so maybe I don't want to do something quite so corny. Right, maybe instead I want just the sky to be um, painted or the sky to be colored. Okay, so I'm going to adjust the hardness to be 100% so that it's a sharp edge. Right, and now you can really see right, what I'm changing, and I'll paint just the sky. All right, now as I get really close, I might have to zoom in a bit. I uh, did control plus to zoom in, right, and I'm holding down space bar as I'm panning, right, and then I might come right along this edge like that. I can also change the size of my brush using the bracket key. So I can make that a little bit smaller and we can tuck in right there. Space bar to move over. Continue right along here. Obviously I'm not doing the best job ever. but you guys don't need to sit here and watch me paint everything. All right, so I'm approaching the end, right? And I'm going along and then all of a sudden, wait, my arm twisted and I made a mistake, right? And I went down into this section and it didn't do what I wanted it to do, okay? Now you could undo or step backwards, but because it's a mask, we actually have the ability to do the opposite. So I've been painting in black on the white background. And you see that white square, right, which was all white, and now the top half is black? That's what I painted, okay? So if I switch my colors so that I'm painting in white, I can actually come back and paint this section back in white and cover up that mistake, right? So it makes life pretty darn easy when I can go backwards and forwards like that. So we'll flip and go back to the black Right? And I'll cruise right along and finish like that. Now I'll press Control-0 so we can see. And so now, with some masking, I have the black and white only applying to the lower half of the image and not the upper half of the image. Okay? So let's turn off the black and white for a second and let's do some other adjustments to this particular image. Okay? Let's work on the foreground right here in this image. So maybe I'll do a curves adjustment. So let me go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. And let's do a curves adjustment. OK, now when I'm working on the curves here, what I'm concerned with is the bottom. I don't care what happens to the rest of this image, right? So maybe I need to, to do something like that to be able to see a little bit more contrast in this lower section, these curves, OK? So the rocks end up standing out a little bit better. Hopefully you guys can see it. Yeah, so you guys can see that the rocks stand out. I'm losing a little bit too much in the shadow here. So on this layer, right, again, I'm going to click on the white square, the mask, and I'll come over to my paintbrush, and I'm going to paint in black, okay? And I want this adjustment to apply to the rocks, but not to the background, right? So I don't want it to apply in here. So I'm going to go ahead and make my brush bigger, like this, and I'm going to paint out everything up above here. 
And then we'll make my brush a little bit smaller. And let me zoom in a bit. All right, and I'm going to come right along here. And again, you guys will take a little bit more time than I'm doing. No, this is just a curves adjustment. And I'm applying here, I'm applying a mask on the curves adjustment. All right, so there it is. And so if we look at the mask now, see how the white is only at the bottom and everything on black, everything up above is black? So this curves adjustment is only applying to the rocks. Right? And you can see when I turn it on and turn it off that it's only applying to the rocks and it's doing nothing up above. Okay? Let's say that I wanted to adjust the sky to be a different color. Right? So maybe, um, and again, I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit, probably not in the photorealistic sense, just so that you guys can see what I'm doing. Right? Let me go new adjustment layer, and I'm going to do a hue and saturation adjustment this time. Not one that we covered before, but I'm going to do this so that you can see it on the screen. I know on the screen it's always hard to see these masks. Okay? So let's say that I really wanted the sky to be a different color. Okay? But I didn't want the ground and everything to be a different color. Okay? So see right now, uh, this is all turning kind of that yellowish color too. I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to mask everything but the sky. Okay? So in this case, we're going to use the paintbrush in, with black again. I'm going to be on my hue and saturation, and I'm going to paint everything going down this way. And actually, let me make the brush bigger so that it goes faster. It's a very smoky sky. OK, so you, you get the idea of how quickly I'm creating this. Now look at this mask. The black is on the bottom, and the white is on the top, Okay, because the, the uh, adjustment is being applied to the top. So again, I'll make my brush a little bit smaller here, right? and I'll go right along those, those hills. And I would, you know, obviously, if this was a final version, I'd spend a little bit more time getting this, this right. But like that, control zero to see everything. And so now this adjustment is applying only, right, to the upper part of the image, which is kind of nice. Okay. Now maybe I did something and I want some clouds to show up in this sky. Okay, and I'm extending what you're doing. So each time I do one of these steps, I'm pushing the boundaries of what you've been able to do. So we talked about blending modes before, right? Okay. So let me go and take a quick look online. Let me do search.creativecommons.org, right? And let's look for cloudy sunset. And we want to search on Flickr. All right. So let's take this one, okay? and I'm going to go ahead and download this file in its large format. And I'm going to move it. So let me show in the folder, maybe. There it is. I'm going to copy this into my folder for today. We're in 106. This is high dynamic range. And I'm going to go ahead and paste this. OK, so there's that sunset. Now let me jump into Photoshop, and I'm going to go to File and Place, like we did last time. I'm going to pick that sunset picture, so right here, and I'm going to place that over the top of my image. Okay, maybe about like that. Okay, now we wanted. I want this to change the blending mode, right? Which is what we did last class. Let me try an overlay and see. Okay, we're getting the. The uh, clouds coming through. Let me turn off my weird yellow sky. Oh, it's not going to let me. Let me commit to this for a second. Let me turn off my yellow sky. Right, and we're starting to see the clouds there, which were not there before. Okay. Obviously, I don't really want everything happening down below here. I don't want the overlap of of this. So in this case, right, I'd like to actually take the mask that I already created. So remember, I had the mask that was just the sky, right? this one. And I want that mask to apply to this layer. So I don't have the white square over here. 
Okay? If I wanted to create the white square from scratch, I'd come down to, there's a rectangle with a circle in the middle of it, which is add layer mask. I could create the layer mask, and then I could paint in black and make this go away. And now, let me turn off the black and white. Now all of a sudden I have the cloudy sky. Okay, do you guys see how I kind of did that? Now, to me, that was a, I already did work to create um, the mask. So I don't want to create a new mask and have to paint it again. Instead, I'm going to hold down Alt, and I'm going to drag the mask that I already created for the sky up on top of this layer. And it creates a copy. I have to hold down Alt to create the copy. And because I already created the mask, I didn't have to create it again. Right? And you see that I now have that mask applied here. Okay? So there's probably a little bit more that I could do to make these clouds really start to come together and blend nicely into my scene. Right? I could control how much, um, you know, what the opacity was. Right? Maybe I need to duplicate this layer so that I have a little bit more shining through. Now I start to see a little bit more of those. Maybe that one was too much. Maybe instead I should imply a lighten, right, which is causing a little bit different effect. Whenever you find the right look, right, um, you know, a multiply is probably not right because that's going to make everything darker, right. But once I find the right look, you can see that I'm very easily controlling. Let's try. It. No, I think I'm going to stick with the overlay for right now. I'm very easily controlling what's what's happening in the image and where in the image certain things are happening. Okay. So today is about experimenting with this whole masking thing, right? The end result doesn't have to be pretty. The end result has to have masking in it. Okay? We will get better at masking. We'll talk about how to refine edges and how to really create high quality masks. But I want you to kind of get your first taste or your first experiment of masking. Okay? And I'll come around and I'll help you as you, as you work through it. So the second part of what we're doing today is um, stitching a panorama together. And so again, I told you this was an automated process. So we'll go up to the File menu. We'll go to Automate. And we'll go to Photo Merge this time. And again, on today's exercise, hold on one second. Let me jump back to today's exercise here. Right Below the HDRs is a bunch of panorama image sets. You can, you can download those. There is, I hope it works, an interactive version of this panorama. That conveniently isn't working. How nice. Let me see if it works in the other one. Yeah, this one works. So there's an interactive version so that you can look around and, and see um, what the panorama is supposed to look like. Anyway, I stitched that together so you guys could actually see it. Okay? So uh, if you download those panoramas, Right? You can group a, a couple of the photos. Right? If you dump all the photos in, chances are it's not going to turn out. Feel free to experiment with how many you want. And this can take a while. If you threw all 40-something images at it, uh, you know, it may take a half hour for Photoshop to do it. It may be faster. I'm going to do a smaller group. And so I'm going to browse for the panoramas. We'll do that Angora Peak one. And I'm going to take, let's see here, let's take one, two, three. And let's take one, two, and three. And let's take one. And I'll go ahead and say OK. So I grouped you know, maybe 10 images or something like that. I did make sure that they overlapped, which is important. Right? I want it to blend images together. Right? And we'll go ahead and say OK. The Layout tab, if you leave it on Auto, you're going to have better results. So I just leave it on Auto. So then we'll go ahead and say OK. And Photoshop is going to open the images. Right, we see it opening. Again, this is an automated process. And then it's going to look at the images and try to align the various images based on what it sees in the images.
if you hold down shift, if, you're, if shift is first picture, last picture, select everything in between, if you hold down control, it will be individuals. So whatever you click on will be selected. OK, so it just finished, right, stitching them together. And you see I picked groups of three images that overlapped. And we get kind of a view that, that is you know, starting over here and kind of gets skewed over to the left here. But if we look carefully, and part of the reason that we do the masking in the part one first, is now we can look at how Photoshop is actually doing this. Okay? So over here on the right in the layer stack, we have a lot of individual images. And so let's, let's start with just one image, okay, right there. And so Photoshop said, I want this image to be able to combine with the image that's next to it in a seamless manner. So what's the easiest seam for me to create, okay, as it unwarps these images? And what it does is it creates a mask around the image. So if we looked at the original image, so here's the image. If I disable the mask, you don't have to do this. Is it not going to let me do it? Oh, come on. OK, if I disabled the layer mask, there's the original image. OK, but Photoshop by itself has created the layer mask for us that cuts off this edge and that then matches up with this image. OK, likewise, as I continue to turn it on, right, there's the next image and they match up. There's the next image and how they match up. So it's effectively creating these complex masks for us. right? But I could also elect to modify these masks to include something or to mask something out. Let's say I had lots of people that were walking through a scene. If I wanted one person to be masked out, in this case, I can't mask him out because my image doesn't overlap enough. If I look at the image that's underneath, which one is it? Yeah, I think it's this image here. No. Yeah, it's that image. If I were to disable this layer mask on that image, I still don't have enough to be able to mask. I would have to have overlap to where I could mask one off the other. So it doesn't really work in this context. But the point is I could adjust those masks to have a better uh, seam uh, or remove somebody in between. So once you have this, I'm going to ask you to do a file save for web. You're probably going to get this message that says it exceeds the size. Just say yes. OK, I'm going to press Control-0 here just so that we can see the whole image. And you see that the one that I'm going to post has these little cuts out of it. right? That's the nature of stitching with Photoshop. It's not going to be cropped or anything. This is fine. This is what I want you to post for part two. For part one, cancel this. Maybe. Maybe not. For part one, you're going to take your image that has the weird compositing on it and the masking, you'll do a file save for web, and you'll save that as well. Okay. So the key here is that we're combining three images into one. Then we're doing some modifications. We're applying some masks. right? Then we save that image. Then we're taking a group of images, let's say at least six images or so. We're going to stitch those together. And then we'll export those and post it under part two. Uh, part two continues on with using Huggin and what have you on the back. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's not even installed on these computers. So that's, that's something you can just skip through. 
uh, and we're just going to post the images to the, the, to the post. If you have a little bit of extra time, it wouldn't hurt for you to read over assignment 102 and then um, look at some of the previous year's examples and that sort of thing so you can get your brain thinking about that. Okay. Remember, next Monday is a holiday. Right? You are more than welcome to show up here, but I will not be here. So I would encourage you not to show up. Right? And go do something fun for your weekend. We'll reconvene on Wednesday. Right? I'll show you a bunch of examples on Wednesday, and we'll start to get into some more advanced masking techniques and, and how that sort of works as we go forward. Okay? Are there any questions? Okay, I'll come and help you.